So, uh, welcome everyone to the ICTS Monthly Colloquium. I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I see most of us have our uh, microphones on mute. I will request you to have your microphones on mute. Uh, if you have questions, please do ask them during the talk, but please raise your hand first. And uh, if our speaker notices it, he'll take a pause. If not, I will interrupt. Uh, and then uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question. We will, of course, have a set of questions uh, at the end as well. Um, Okay, uh, with that, um, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is uh, Colin Q. Patrick Coalfield, and I hope I said all of that correctly. Uh, <laughs> professor Coalfield is, uh, is a professor of environmental and industrial fluid dynamics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he's the head of the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics a member of the BP Institute of Multiphase Flow, and a professorial fellow of Churchill College. He received his uh, bachelor's honors in mathematics from the University of Ulster in 1987, and then went on to do uh, the famous part three tripos, as well as his PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Cambridge. Uh, you know, he's held faculty positions at Bristol, and at UC San Diego and has been at Cambridge since 2005. And he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, uh, member of the executive committee of the summer study program in uh, Woods Hole, which recently was also online. Um, and he's an associate editor of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. His research interests are stability, transition, turbulence, and mixing, uh, particularly in fluids where density differences play significant role. And as we can see from his title, uh, today I guess he'll talk about all of those topics. So with that, I hand it over to Professor Caulfield. Please take it over. So thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction and thank you for this uh, uh, invitation. I think having these sort of uh, opportunities is pretty much the only uh, silver lining of uh, the present crisis that we all find ourselves in. Um, and so I very much appreciate this invitation to give this uh, colloquium and uh, and I hope uh, everything technically works. And uh, just as I um, start, uh, I'd like to do some uh, acknowledgements, of course, to the funding agencies uh, that supported this work, the uh, Natural Environment Research Council and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council of uh, the UK uh, Research Innovation, UKRI, and also, as uh, was already mentioned, uh, the uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Program at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It had a major influence on my career. And also, this is somewhat edited highlights of some lectures I gave uh, last year uh, as part of the, the program on uh, stratified mixing. And then, of course, there is a... Oh, there is a huge number of uh, people who uh, went into actually doing this work. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge all the various uh, people who've worked with me on this uh, problem, which has obsessed me really for 30 years. Um, and uh, the listing here shows the people who, were, um, who worked with me first as students, uh, the people who worked with me first when they were uh, postdocs and then uh, more senior uh, people below. And the uh, ones that are uh, highlighted in red, uh, I'm going to be particularly talking about some of the work uh, that they have uh, done with me. It will be actually highlighted uh, during this talk. And um, it's quite interesting that they come from 21 different uh, uh, countries and there's 80 different uh, people uh, involved in this uh, activity. It's really been uh, a real team effort. So what, what, what is the motivation for, what, uh, for under, wanting to think about turbulent uh, stratified mixing? Well, of course, the issue is to do with that other crisis that's not on the front pages at the moment, but is still pressing for us, of course, the uh, climate crisis. And uh, this is from a year ago, but it's still at uh, this uh, very, very telling uh, picture about how the uh, heat that is in the oceans uh, is increasing. Uh, and you'll see uh, from 1955 to 2015, 
it's not entirely monotonic. There are things that uh, oscillate around, but you see that the oceans, the Earth's oceans are heating up, and that has a major uh, critical uh, effect uh, on our uh, lives or potential effect on our lives. Of course, uh, the uh, surface uh, temperature of the ocean is very, very important to, to feed back onto the weather systems. Um, monsoon, of course, uh, particular interest in uh, the, um, India. And then there's also, you know, melting of, uh, of ice uh, and in particular, the, of course, melting of the land-based ice will completely change um, uh, sea level and that will lead to uh, major potential concerns for us going forwards. And understanding how heat is transported in the ocean is a really critical part of uh, understanding the global climate system. The news talks very much about the atmosphere heating up, but really it's very, very important to appreciate how, how critical the role is of the heat content of the oceans for determining the global climate system. So here's the classical schematic of what they call the uh, conveyor belt um, of uh, the meridional overturning circulation, uh, driving these uh, uh, large uh, currents that effectively transport uh, heat from the uh, near the equator, where of course it's hotter, towards the poles, and so that you have these currents like the um, Gulf Stream in the Atlantic um, that carries this uh, heat uh, uh, northwards. And then there is a return flow at depth, though that return flow at depth is quite uh, uh, complicated. You can have different uh, circulations as in this schematic here. You can have uh, Antarctic bottom water and North Atlantic deep water, as well as the surface uh, uh, mix layer. So there's a multiple cells of different uh, uh, circulations within the world's ocean that still poleward are transporting uh, heat measurable in the uh, petawatts, the 10 to the 15 uh, watts. Uh, of the order of two petawatts is being transported from the pole, from the equator towards the pole in the world's ocean. And the world's ocean really contains the vast majority of the heat in the um, global uh, climate system. A very nice way to appreciate it is if you think about uh, uh, the column of air uh, with some bottom surface area, let's say a meter square, and think of the column of air in the entire world's atmosphere which is defined as being 100 kilometers. Uh, you know, these ideas of being taken to spaces that you, can you go out 100 kilometers. Now that column of air is a given volume of air and it, that will the, it gets heated up by the greenhouse effect or whatever. The amount of heat required to raise that entire column of atmosphere, that a high, entire 100 kilometers of atmosphere, the amount of heat to raise the temperature of that column of air by one degree, is the same amount of heat as is required to increase the temperature of the same column of water beneath it in the ocean that only extends 3.4 meters down. And remember, the ocean is roughly speaking about five kilometers deep. And so the point I'm trying to make is the amount of heat in the ocean is enormous compared to the amount of heat in the atmosphere. And so if the atmosphere heats up, the critical question is, how much of the heat up of the atmosphere then interacts with the ocean is, uh, you know, you get the hot layer, at the, the, if you heat up the upper surface, does that heat mix down in the ocean or does it stay near the top? And so understanding how that heat is transported vertically in the ocean is a key process in modeling the climate system, is one of the key uncertainties. This arrow that stops it just being very hot near the top and very cold near the bottom, that mixing within the ocean, which is typically associated with turbulence, is one of the key uncertainties in the global climate system. And so if we think about one of the many things that we're worried about for the climate crisis is sea level rise. So you can see this uh, sea level, uh, here, here is real data and here are the extrapolations to the future, which of course have uncertainties. And so far, you know, there's been uh, changes in sea level rise of the order of uh, 10 centimeters. But of course, and again, if it, the projected out over the next uh, uh, century or so, there is potential uh, uh, sea level rises of 50 centimeters, which will have enormous, on average, which will have enormous effects on many coastal uh, situations. You know, the flooding, the flooding effects would be horrendous. Wouldn't be good to be in the Netherlands, for example. But you see that the projections have a wide range of uncertainty. 
And really that wide range of uncertainty is associated, the biggest uncertainties are associated with three physical processes. Understanding how ice sheets, how the uh, Greenland or the Antarctic uh, uh, ice sheets, how they interact, how they, what happens as they melt, uh, the North uh, Pole as it, as it melts, though it doesn't necessarily change this, the sea level rise, of course, because it's already floating, the melting of it. Of course, the albedo effect greatly changes. So if it's no longer white, but it's kind of blue, that will have a very, very different uh, uh, feedback on the global climate system. So, so it's really uncertain about ice sheets. It's also clearly very uncertain about clouds as you heat up the atmosphere how is the feedback between the evaporation, the trapping of effect that clouds have on the atmosphere, uh, on, on heat, but also they can reflect uh, heat back. Very, very uncertain, the dynamics of clouds. But it's also, and that's the topic that I'm particularly interested, deeply uncertain about how this mixing can happen in the ocean, the mixing associated with, in, with internal waves. Because of course, the ocean is stratified. It's less dense near the top, more dense as you go down. And so in such a density field, you inevitably have a wave field, the internal waves, the inertia gravity waves. They can also be affected by rotation. So they can be, if a storm forms, you can set up uh, waves uh, um, uh, at near the inertial frequency. You can have, uh, as currents flow over topography you lift dense parcels up you uh, they go uh, down again you can have waves in the lee you have tides and there's internal tides in the ocean flow going backwards and forwards and so you can have internal waves being triggered due to tidal flow interaction with topography but all these processes <clears throat> excuse me when you set up a wave the wave can transport momentum around but it's really when the waves break that they actually cause mixing. And if they cause mixing, that then tends to redistribute density parcels vertically. So it's understanding how that uh, mixing processes, those particularly wave-wave interactions, are the things that we are interested in. And as a classically trained sort of applied mathematician, I appreciate the global climate system is really, uh, the ocean is really complicated. There's lots and lots of things going on, but I want to focus in on just thinking about very idealized cases to understand how can you have mixing in the stratified fluid that is driven by breaking internal waves, let's say, but is going to be an interaction therefore between wave-like motion, velocity shears, density stratification, how do these interact and can we understand how those processes occur? And so fundamentally the question that I'm interested in and I have been interested in can be summarized as really saying can you understand the taxation rate at which stratification taxes turbulence? And I want to keep this, this funny analogy of the idea of how does stratification tax turbulence? Because if you have a stratified fluid as I've shown here is schematically on the side, you lift a parcel, so the density varies, so it's more dense near the bottom, less dense higher up. If you lift a dense parcel upwards in that uh, regime, you are increasing the potential energy of the system. And so there's an energetic transfer from, let's say, kinetic energy to potential energy. But also turbulence, of course, is, an, is a mechanism by which you extract large scale energy, you increase the dissipation, you have an extraction of energy that goes into uh, uh, internal energy, the dissipation increases. And so the question is, if I'm mixing fluid that is stratified, I can both be lifting dense parcels, I will be on average perhaps lifting dense parcels up, and if I'm on average lifting dense parcels up, I will then be having the exchange not only of large-scale kinetic energy into this dissipation, but also large-scale kinetic energy going into potential energy, which is a taxation rate. And really, the way you'd want to model that is the classical sort of idea of a gradient uh, uh, diffu diffusion sort of argument. I want to work out some eddy diffusivity, this kappa T, which is a way that I can relate second-order correlations, complicated vertical velocity perturbations, density perturbations, averaged in some way, which we're not going to get into now. And I want to relate that to some mean gradient, which might be possible for me to measure and is an easy thing to do. It's a classical eddy diffusivity argument. But you'll see that the top is, is a density flux. 
And if on average I am lifting dense parcels up, so the density fluctuations are, are positive, the vertical velocity positive, that will be on average I'm lifting dense parcels up. So I'm increasing the potential energy of the system. So I want, so I need to understand how much the, this uh, density flux uh, varies because I might easily be able to measure the mean gradient, but I really want to understand to parameterize this quantity so that I can understand this any diffusivity. And so in these larger scale uh, climate models, I can describe the effect of turbulence. And here I'm showing you, you know, there's three pretty videos of three different problems. We have a shear instability, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, big overturning. We have a uh, forcing of stratified uh, turbulence and you see you inevitably get this sort of layer wise structures. And here we even have a, it, it's a video of an experiment and we see this intermittent, this is a shadow graph. And so you see this intermittent formation of interfaces and uh, interfaces disappearing and reappearing and they're at angles and then they stop being at angles, they get smooth. All these questions we want to understand what is the subtle interplay between turbulence and density field, okay? So let's think about a bit about the energetics. And here, once again, is the, is, is the conceptual picture. If I have a stratification, and if I have turbulence within that stratification, what does that turbulence do? Does it do nothing at all and not mix the stratification at all? Does it completely homogenize the middle layer, which clearly has increased the potential energy quite a bit? Or does it do something in between, which I showed the green line? And this is this idea about how you compartmentalize uh, um, the, the energy that is lost by kinetic by a, a turbulent flow into viscous dissipation, that's this term, and this uh, density flux or buoyancy flux. So if I think about the uh, uh, turbulent kinetic energy equation, so I take the Navier-Stokes equations and just take a dot product with the velocity, I'll see, I will inevitably get a divergence of a flux. There'll be some transport terms around the system. But I, you know, I can understand them by boundary contributions or something. There'll be turbulent production, particularly if I have, a, this is the simple situation, if I have a vertical shear, there'll be a, a vertical shear will be, allow me to extract energy from the mean shear and pump it into the uh, perturbation via the action of the Reynolds stresses. I will have viscous dissipation, classical uh, viscous dissipation. This is, of course, the uh, deformation tensor. But then I also have the possibility of the buoyancy flux, because if there is density variations, lifting dense parcels up, there's a buoyancy force which wants to push it, push it back down. And so if I take the dot, that acts in the vertical direction, the W direction. And so if I take the dot product of the, this density fluctuation with the, um, uh, with the velocity, I'll get a term of this form, W rho prime. So that term will appear in my equation. So the question is, how do I, how do I compartmentalize between the turbulent production, because if I'm in some appropriate steady state, this doesn't change, this is just transporting stuff around. That's the forcing. I, it's in a steady state. How does the, how of the turbulence production, how much of it goes into viscous dissipation and how much of it goes into buoyancy flux, which is the part of this mixing. And the classical, classical model is to say there's a standard, there's, a, there's an upper bound on the mixing, on this rate. That about, that always about less than, this is about 20% of that the classical argument due to uh, uh, Osborne. Very, very important paper in 1980. And it's kind of plausible, right? Because if you say you're in steady state, you have three terms, you all expect them to kind of scale the same. And so therefore, if you, you'd expect this quantity to be proportional to epsilon, and the constant of proportionality from experiments seems to be about 20, 0.2. Okay, and if I have this sort of argument, well, kappa T, I can write as gamma. If, if I say that, B is gamma times epsilon, I just substitute it in. And then if I'm an appropriately trained uh, scientist, I say, well, that, I want to make this a dimensionless quantity. This is a diffusivity. So if I multiply above and below by viscosity, I have a diffusivity. So that has the right dimensions. This gamma is some parameter here. And so then I get this non-dimensional quantity, dissipation rate divided by the viscosity, and N squared, of course, is the buoyancy frequency. It's this uh, uh, quantity here. It's the frequency that if I lift a dense parcel up, it's the frequency at which it will oscillate up and down. Because, of course, if I lift a dense parcel up, it feels a, buoyant, a restoring force. It wants to return to its equilibrium position. It has the velocity when it returns to its equilibrium position. So it just bobs up and down uh, with a, uh, at this frequency, the buoyancy frequency. 
Okay, so that seems all very plausible. So I have kappa t is nu gamma by the buoyancy uh, uh, Reynolds, so this quantity, the buoyancy Reynolds number, is just what this parameter is called. And there's another way that you can also uh, think about this. Rather than having this ratio, you can say, okay, well, if I want, this is what my pay is, and I want to understand how much of my pay goes into the taxation of increasing the stratification. And that quantity is called the flux Richardson number. It's clearly related to this gamma, which is by simple manipulation. Buoyancy flux divided by the um, turbulence production. So we might wonder how can we model these particular quantities. But it's also very important to appreciate that really, if we're saying we're interested in mixing, mixing isn't really something that is associated with necessarily with energetic descriptions, it should actually be associated with reducing variance. So here's just a video of a, of a, of a, pipe, of a uh, plane procyclone, not pipe flow, and we start off with uh, a layer of blue stuff at the bottom, red stuff at the top, and we perturb it in some way and hope it homogenizes into this green, the mixed value. So it starts off as being plus 0.5 when it's red, minus 0.5 when it's uh, blue, but then it's homogenized to being zero. And really, crucially, what's happening is that we are reducing the variance of this quantity. And so you, you can write down an equation for the density variance in appropriately scale with the buoyancy frequency if we're a dynamic scalar. And we can similarly write down an equation for this buoyancy variance, which is actually quite closely related to a potential energy equation. But crucially, we can see that we have some transport term. We have this buoyancy flux term again, which would be increasing this, these uh, uh, variance terms. And then there is a variance destruction term, chi, which has exactly the form we'd want it to have, that it is truly a mixing process because it involves the molecular diffusivity of the scalar, kappa. And so this is like, this is analogous to the dissipation rate epsilon of kinetic energy, but what we're doing is we're dissipating buoyancy variance, density variance. And so, of course, a characteristic of a particular fluid we might have is the Prandtl number, which is the ratio of the two diffusivities, the diffusivity of, of momentum that's in the, um, uh, the, the kinematic viscosity, which is in the dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy. And this kappa, which is in the dissipation rate of this buoyancy variance, this chi. And so if we're in steady state, however, we can see that if we're in steady state, we expect the buoyancy flux, which was turning up in the energetic equation, to be like this chi. And so really, kappa t can then be thought of as chi over n squared rather than b over n squared. And that's really a natural way to think about it, which was appreciated actually a previous paper by Osborne and Cox, 1972, had this idea. And so really, we want to understand, can we understand how chi might vary as well to understand, to be able to solve this kappa t. Now, if we remember our eddy viscosity of momentum, we could say that the eddy viscosity of the momentum is once again relating second order quantities, u and w, to a shear, a first order quantity of the mean flow. But if I multiply this above and below by du dz, I'll see I get the, tur the turbulence production on the top and then the shear squared on the bottom. And so the turbulent parameter number of the flow, the eddy diffusivity of momentum divided by the eddy diffusivity for heat or this scalar, I was talking about heat, but it's really, it's the, it's the dynamic scalar that's changing the density, is if I just write the terms in, well, remember kappa t was b over n squared, and nu t we see as p, the turbulence production, divided by the shear squared. We've said on the last slide that the buoyancy flux divided by the production is this flux Richardson number, so that's on the numerator, denominator. But the, we now have left over to a ratio of time scales, n squared and s squared, which is, of course, if you know this field, it's the Richardson number. It's the balancing between how important uh, the buoyancy is compared to how important the shear is. And this is actually, for me, one of the intuitive reasons why the uh, turbulent, why it's appropriate to call it the turbulent, to the uh, flux Richardson number. Because you'll see, if the turbulent Prandtl number is about one, the Richardson number and the flux Richardson number must, just by mathematics, be about the same. And so that says something very, very interesting and potentially deep, which we'll be returning to, which is turbulent Prandtl number being about one 
is saying that you mix momentum kind of like you mix heat. And that then says that what's really happening is that the scalar, the heat, is not really affecting the turbulence much. And the eddies that are mixing the momentum, dissipating the flow, are kind of like the eddies that are mixing the heat. And that then tells us that we expect the flux Richardson number and the Richardson number to be about the same. But there's maths, which, we, we, which is known, which says that the, for the flow to be strongly turbulent, we don't expect the Richardson number to be very large, which will be something we'll come back to. Okay, there's also, I mean, this is all description in terms of shear, but you might imagine that it's not necessarily, a flow may not be sheared, because this has inevitably has this velocity shear. So there's another thing that could be important, which would be the turbulent dissipation rate, which has dimensions L2 T minus three, compared to the amount of turbulence you have at the moment, L2 T minus K, which has dimensions L2 T minus two, and the buoyancy frequency N. So this defines a turbulent fruit number. So I've been blathering on for a while and we've got all these different possible parameters. And so really the question is, it, this mixing rate, this, uh, this taxation rate, the turbulent flux coefficient gamma, it could depend on properties of the fluid, like the Prandtl number, nu over kappa. It could depend on a property of the shear, the Richardson number, n squared over s squared. It could depend on properties of the turbulence, the turbulent fluid number, epsilon over nk. Or it could depend on the turbulent uh, Prandtl number. You know, it, it, in the expression it came out, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the buoyancy Reynolds number, not the turbulent Prandtl number, the buoyancy Reynolds number, that, the REB, which remember was epsilon over nu n squared, which is kind of a combination of something to do with the stratification and the buoyancy. So you might think you have these four different parameters, but it's very important to appreciate that they could possibly be correlated. And just one simple argument you might have, once again I said, when the turbulent Prandtl number is about one, we'd expect the turbulence to not be strongly affecting the stratification, the being, being strongly affected by the stratification. So then the dissipation rate you'd expect would scale like the typical um, inertial scaling but dating back to Taylor of U cubed over L, where U is some characteristic uh, velocity field scale and L is some characteristic length scale. And similarly, you'd expect the kinetic en turbulent kinetic energy to scale like the square of this velocity, U squared. And you'd expect the shear, since that scales like u and a characteristic length scale of the flow is l, you'd expect the shear to scale like u over l. But then, we would, if we substitute in this expression for epsilon and this expression for k, we'll find that the inverse square of the fruit number, the, 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 eps, that goes like u cubed over l, this goes like u, so of course this just reduces to u over ln, that's why we call it the uh, fruit number. But u over ln is to the minus two is n squared divided by u squared divided by l squared, which of course is the Richardson number within this scaling. So it's very important to appreciate that if it's weakly stratified, you might think that, the, that you might think these parameters will be independent, but actually they would tend up to scale the same and the Richardson number will be relatable to the inverse square of the Froude number, which we will return to. Okay, so that's the, what I want to talk about for the next half hour is really, can we understand how this might scale? Because we've got gamma, can we identify how this gamma might depend on these different parameters? Because the fundamental question was, if we had this uh, uh, problem back here, kappa t would go like nu, which we could measure by gamma, and then the turbulent, uh, the buoyancy Reynolds number. So if we, ha we have to understand to get the models right, does gamma depend on any of these parameters? Does it depend on the Prandtl number? Does it depend on the Richardson number, the turbulent fruit number, or the buoyancy Reynolds number? So, does it? Very important work from Stanford, dating back uh, 20 year, pretty much 20 years now. This was in a review article from 2008 by Ivy, but it's the old data from uh, Xi et al. 2005. It says that if you look at the eddy diffusivity of uh, heat and you plotted against the buoyancy Reynolds number from uh, simulations, you see a region where it is gamma is quite close to 0.2, but then when buoyancy Reynolds number gets large, it looks like gamma decreases like uh, REB to the minus a half. And indeed observations uh, by uh, Steve Monosmith and his co-workers and do indeed see this sort of phenomenon. It does seem that the buoyancy Reynolds numbers, uh, you get to large buoyancy Reynolds numbers, the flux Richardson number, which of course is related to gamma, does decrease and it seems to kind of decrease like buoyancy Reynolds number to the minus a half. So, can we understand that? Because of, 
critical question, of course, is it could be depending on different parameters. There could be some of this uh, hidden correlation between parameters. And when we're at large values of buoyancy Reynolds number, because remember n squared is on the bottom, it could be that we're in weakly stratified regimes. So let's see if we can understand this problem. Because the reviews suggested that uh, from 2008, the laboratory and DNS work indicate that at the extremes, when either the buoyancy Reynolds number is small or the buoyancy Reynolds number is large, the mixing efficiency, this flux Richardson number, tends to zero, and saying it's about 0.2 doesn't work. So the question is, does mixing vary with the buoyancy Reynolds number, or does it vary with other parameters? Because 10 years later, there was a review uh, from Mike Gregg and colleagues, which is in... Um, uh, a group from Washington, effectively, uh, University of Washington, and they were saying that it's long been understood that mixing efficiency is unlikely to be constant, but kappa rho, this uh, eddy diffusivity, what I've called kappa t, from traces and microstructure, real observations, evaluated with gamma, Richardson number, or band chi epsilon, the two different ones I defined it, being about 0.2, agree better than do coefficients from efficiencies uh, and efficiencies from simulations and experiments. So that's saying, it kind of suggests that gamma is constant, or at least bounded above by a 0.2. So can we investigate that? Well, the way we investigated that was we did it, we set up a numerical simulation, it ends up being quite large, and we forced a shear, and we required it to have an average uh, uh, linear gradient in density. And if you set, and we, in a periodic box, and if you set the system up like this, you can see that the way that the stratification, the density feeds back on the velocity is via a scaling uh, uh, parameter. There's really a coupling coefficient which takes the form of the Richardson number. And really, the critical, which is like you're changing gravity. So you can make gravity stronger, the buoyancy force stronger or weaker, while still requiring the mean shear to be constant and the density gradient to be constant. It's really the, couple, the strength of the coupling is what matters. And so we were therefore able to do, to do a simulation where we were able to fix the viscosity, so we chose, we're effectively choosing the Reynolds number, and we varied the Richardson number, this coupling coefficient, until we got a steady state that was associated with a certain intensity of turbulence, which we were aiming for. We had a target intensity of the turbulence, kappa T. And the way we did this was with, effectively with a damped oscillator, which is if we found this scaled uh, energy was increasing above one, that means the turbulence was too strong, we turned up the effect of the stratification, increased the Richardson number so that that would damp down the turbulence. Conversely, if the turbulence was dying, the stratification was too strong, we would turn down gravity, reduce the value of the Richardson number, so that then the turbulence could increase. So what would happen would be, we would have a target amount of turbulent kinetic energy, we would have a tar target viscos a set viscosity, and when we reach steady state, the value of the Richardson number at that steady state would emerge, the dissipation rate would emerge, and also this taxation rate, how big chi was compared to the dissipation rate of the turbulent kinetic energy, would emerge as a part of the solution. And so we would find, when we were, we were able therefore to vary the buoyancy Reynolds number, because the larger the target value of turbulent intensity was, the larger the dissipation rate clearly had to be to be steady, but we wouldn't know what that particular numerical value was until we'd run our simulation. Okay, and so we were able to do this. And we were able to search across, you know, factor of 30 different uh, values of the buoyancy rounds numbers emerge from the experiment. So when the buoyancy rounds number wasn't very big, we had, didn't have lots of small scales. When the buoyancy rounds number was a lot larger, this was uh, buoyancy rounds number 550 here, you see a lot more small scales than you do there. This is a density field sliced through the middle of the domain but we were able to find out what the parameters that emerged organically from our calculation. And we found out, amazingly, that the Richardson number, when we were at steady state, was pretty close to 0.16. And the buoyancy, yet the buoyancy Reynolds number varied by a factor of 30. And these key parameters, gamma was pretty much 0.2. The taxation rate was pretty much 0.2. And the turbulent Prandtl number was pretty much 1. So really what was happening was when we were in 
if it's statistically steady, it's saying the turbulence isn't, the stratification isn't very strong and that the density is just being mixed as if it was a passive scalar. And that mixing is exactly the same uh, as predicted by the Osborne theory. We didn't observe this variation with buoyancy um, uh, Reynolds number. When we were really controlling everything else, because the turbulent fruit number wasn't varying, the Richardson number wasn't varying, it was exactly true. And we found something very similar. Even when we varied the Prandtl number by a very large uh, variation, by a factor of 100, in stratified plane coet flow. So what we did was we had one wall that was hot and moved at a constant velocity. The other wall that was cold and moved at a constant velocity in the different direction. And this forced a, flu a turbulent stratified uh, flux shear flow. And here we were able to work out how the flux Richardson number and the Richardson number varied in a whole range of different simulations. And they were exactly, pretty much exactly the same, right? And that then says that indeed we have a turbulent Prandtl number that's about one and we have a mixing efficient, we have a, a flux Richardson number which is about 0.16, which is the gamma is about 0.2. And we observed that exactly. This is also when the flow is weakly stratified because Richardson number is relatively small. If it's weakly stratified, we therefore, as I said, expect the scaling of the dissipation rate to be about the, to be inertial, go like u cubed over l, and so we expect the Richardson number to scale like the inverse square of the fruit number, which is exactly consistent with uh, old experiments uh, from uh, Van Atta and uh, Rohr et al, which showed that when the turbulent fruit number was large, you expect your flux coefficient to go like fr to the minus two. Large turbulent fruit number is small Richardson number and you have that exactly scaling. It's what we, what's observed. So that seems to be, if the flow is forced to be statistically steady, gamma is about 0.2 and you can't have strongly stratified situations. It's, it's going like turbulent Prandtl numbers about one, Richardson numbers about 0.16, the taxation rate's about 20%. But how about if you have shear flows, open shear flows? These are all force flows trying to be statistically uh, steady, but you can have flow instabilities, like I was showing those nice uh, Kelvin Helmholtz billows. And really, there's different uh, dynamics that can be associated with these uh, flows. So, and there's particularly two different types of, types of mixing. So we have, if the stratification is relatively uh, diffuse spread out you can have this overturning kelvin helmholtz billow which has a big overturning and smears out the flow and you get a situation which is like this eddy diffusivity argument right it is it, it, turbulence is acting as a diffusive process that's smearing out gradients conversely if you have a very sharp interface um which can happen when the when the Prandtl number is relatively large in the flow you get a different kind of instability you get called the Holmbo instability. And instead of a large overturning, you have vorticity above and below the sharp interface and you have propagating, they propagate along and you kind of scour the interface. You have eddies that bump against the interface but don't erode it and it lasts much longer. And so the question is, what is the mixing associated with these two different uh, uh, paradigms, the overturning Kelvin Helmholtz below or the sharp interface Holmbo instability? And of course, we, then the question is, simulate them and see what happens. Now, you see that if you do the Hombo instability, you have a very, very curious uh, result. So we have, the, so what you do with the flow, it goes turbulent and it stays turbulent for quite a long time. And so if you plot the value of, you, you can, at every instant in time in a simulation, you can take a horizontal average and you can work out at the, what the horizontal average velocity shear is and you can work out what the horizontally averaged uh, density gradient is, so what the buoyancy frequency is. And so even though the flow is turbulent, you can work out what's underlying at every point in space and time what the actual Richardson number is in the flow. You can just work that underlying quantity out. It's not, a, it's not really what the, it, the flow is very turbulent, but the mean profiles of, of velocity and density 
are given by this process. And you see that if you stack up those profiles, plot them one after another, this is a, a profile at one time, profile another time, the time is set to be the time when the two-dimensional instability is at its strongest, which is at this instant, you'll see that the colors all kind of about green in this picture. And so then if you work out point-wise what the local values of the Richardson number is for all these different uh, notional profiles and plot them as a probability density function for varying the initial sharpness of the density interface, the initial um, bulk value of the Richardson number varying by a factor of uh, four for the bulk Richardson number and the sharpness of the interface by a factor of eight, you find that they all collapse on the same sort of plot and it looks like the flow is kind of going entering a kind of uh, critical uh, self-organized criticality in that they are strongly peaked around 0.25 the, the value where the flow if it were lamina would be marginally stable due to a, the theorem due to miles and howard isn't that curious and so for such hombo driven instability, this scout, turbulent mixing associated with it, if we look at a value of gamma for all these different eight different simulations, and we plot the value of gamma, we see there's a blip, and then it tends towards 0.2. This 0.2 value emerges again for the hombo type instabilities because they're scouring, because there's sharp interfaces, and it runs along and it's just organizing always to be about Richardson number 0.2. Whereas a Kelvin Helmholtz simulation can have a much larger value of gamma because it has the potential to be much more efficient. This big overturning, this big splashing overturning can drive a lot more mixing. So gamma is about bounded by 0.2 if you have Hombo instability, but if you have a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, these nice big overturnings, you can have a much bigger value of gamma. And so we we looked at uh, the values of gamma associated with this big Kelvin Helmholtz overturning, and we found that actually it did a very good uh, approximation. There are simulations uh, uh, are plotted over here, and here's observational data uh, from uh, lakes and oceans that you can see that you have uh, gamma in, uh, plotted against buoyancy Reynolds number. It goes up and then goes down. And it doesn't really sit close to the 0.2 scaling, the, the, the let's just go with the constant value, the Washington State, uh, the Washington University of Washington argument, the Greg 2018 uh, argument. But actually it does show that the buoyancy Reynolds number, it decays with the buoyancy Reynolds number, REB to the minus a half, that's, we change the peak value, the value at which it becomes peak in this particular formula, but you'll see this particular formula as buoyancy Reynolds number gets very large, it will start to decay like buoyancy Reynolds number to the minus a half. And that is indeed consistent with the observational data and consistent with our simulations. So it suggests that in this very transient type of mixing, this large overturning, you can actually observe this buoyancy Reynolds number to the minus a half uh, scaling. But, it, but if you're in steady state, you kind of, a, the gamma is 0.2 or quasi steady state gamma 0.2. But both of these situations are still in some sense weakly stratified because they have to have these strong instabilities. The turbulent Prandtl number being about one means that the uh, buoyancy, um, means that the Richardson number is about the same as the flux Richardson number. And if the, if the gamma is uh, 0.2, that means the flux Richardson number is one sixth. So it means that it's always Richardson numbers about one sixth. It's always relatively weakly stratified. So the question is, can we get a strongly stratified flow that is still turbulent? And the crux is, you're not you if you have vert, if you have shear in this sense, if you have the Kelvin Helmholtz roll up that you're seeing here, velocity going in this direction at the top, velocity going in that direction at the bottom, rolling it up means that you've got to lift dense parcels up. So it's always energetically expensive to do that but if we introduce horizontal shear or forcing in a different way we might be able to have more strongly stratified flows and so that's what we tried in this particular uh, experiment which is uh, stratified Taylor Coet but actually stratified Taylor Coet so we have uh, inner cylinder rotating outer cylinder stationary with an initially linearly stratified uh, uh, profile and what happens, these are beautiful experiments of my student, uh, Kanwa Nain Singh. You see, this is a, a, an image of um, shadow graph, right? So you see density gradients. 
And so you see, you get these sharp interfaces. If I don't know if you can see the pointer, but I'm pointing at there's a sharp interface. You can see it, and then it disappears through a turbulent process, and then reappears, disappears, reappears. So if you take the video and take a vertical line here and save that one line, and then the next frame of the video, you put the next line beside it, and the next line beside it, and the next line beside it, you construct the middle video. And so you see this is stacking up of lines from this other video. And you see that you have sharp interfaces, turbulent mixing event, sharp interface, turbulent mixing event. So when this flow is strongly stratified, actually what happens is you get a layer interface structure of sharp interfaces, well-mixed layers, and near the sharp interface, there's a turbulent activity which scours some of the flow. And if we look at how the flux goes, we see this monotonic, this nice behavior, which suggests that gamma is constant even here. So even when the flow is, we think it's strongly stratified and we're observing a constant value of gamma, but what that really means is we have regions that are very well mixed and sharp interfaces. So instead of having a uniform strong stratification, we have extremely strong stratification in some places, which is being scoured by, by turbulence in a relatively weakly stratified region beside it. So that's very suggestive. Can we think about this numerically? So there's also suggestive evidence from a very nice pair of papers, uh, the uh, Stockholm group, uh, Mappioli et al. from KTH in 2016, and then uh, um, the Colorado State uh, uh, group, uh, Karen Anagamorthy, uh, also did a paper in 20, 2019, replotting some of the other data. And so this is, you start off with a turbulent flow, and you continually force that stratified turbulent flow by injecting energy at low wave numbers, let's say, and then see, try and keep it in steady state, but have it to be very strongly vertically stratified without, any background, without an overall background shear, not relying on the kelvin helmholtz type process. And here is gamma plotted against not the buoyancy reynolds number, not the Richardson number, but the turbulent Froude number, epsilon over nk. So when very, very strongly stratified means this quantity tends to zero. When it's weakly stratified, they see indeed this Froude number to the minus two, this um, uh, Prandtl number one, weakly stratified, RI going like Flux Richards number, no, it's the Flux Richards number going like RI. That comes out clear as a bell, and as I said, in both uh, the data sets. But then something interesting happens when you go to more strongly stratified regimes. Um, the, uh, Colorado State Group basically said it was going to gamma 0.5, which is like the maximum value that you had for the Kelvin Helmholtz below. Um, the uh, Swedish group saw it went to 0.5, but then dropped back down, but still stayed to some, was tending some constant value uh, when you went to larger, when you were going to very, very strong stratification. So we thought to revisit the simulations, re test different forcing mechanisms, analyze, do, do our own suite, analyze in different ways, and that's where we get this picture. And the picture you see, this video you see here, this is a video of the dissipation, and when you actually look at it, you inevitably see, analogous to the taylor Cowett problem, you get spontaneous layer interface structure. You get regions where the turbulence is relatively strong, and regions where the turbulence is relatively weak. Strong and weak turbulence. And if you then ask the question, what's the taxation rate going on point-wise in this, uh, this flow, because we can work out different values. We, we, so therefore we plot chi, which is the destruction of the buoyancy variance, which can be defined point-wise, against the point-wise values of epsilon, we'll see a, perfect, a really good correlation, and they are going like gamma is about 0.4, about 0.5. 0.496 is about 0.5. So about that, what that means is about a third of the energy is going into increasing the potential energy. Oh, I see uh, Rama has raised a hand. Yes, please ask the question. Hi. So I just wanted to know, like, you know, the thickness of these alternating layers, how does that yes. have to do with the overall stratification? You know, the apportionment between strong and weak uh, turbulence and strong and weak stratification. Oh, so I, the, the scaling of those layers typically ends up being some external scale. It's a U over N scaling. 
So there's, so there's the original buoyancy frequency, there were the original mean buoyancy frequency you started off with, and then some characteristic velocity scale. But so really in this case, that characteristic velocity scale is effectively being injected by our chosen forcing mechanism. So we had a trade-off between how much resolution we would have to be able to resolve everything and to ensure it. So you see you have like two or three layers in this, uh, in this case. So that we believe there are other um, uh, experiments and observations say that that scaling uh, works provided you're sufficiently uh, turbulent. But we didn't, in this case, we only wanted to see, to try and set up a layer and an interface, a layer and interface to understand the mixing properties that ensued. So, uh, like, uh, especially in your previous graph of the Taylor Kuwait, you had a very nice uh, uh, spacing. So, I wanted to know how that changes when you. Change oh, oh, oh no! So, so, so in the Taylor Kuwait, we can understand that case, case scaling uh, very clearly because there we do have a well-defined velocity scale that's being given to us by the rotation uh, rate of the inner cylinder, and so then that. Uh, uh, and the gap width, so we, we were able to change the gap width and the rotation rate of the inner cylinder. So basically the size of the inner cylinder and its speed, we had the outer cylinder fixed. And so the velocity scale associated with that is the um, rotation rate of the inner cylinder. And then the length scale is the geometric mean of the inner radius and the gap width. And that scale, that then gives us the characteristic scale of the velocities, which we were able to, fluid velocities, which we were able to measure by PIV process as well. And that then, then the scaling of U over N, the, the, the gap, the layer separation was very well set up by that. So we changed the, we made the inner rotation rate faster. The layers got deeper. We made the, strat the, the original linear gradient in stratification stronger the layers got uh, uh, smaller. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, but though that same data can be replotted against values of the turbulent fluid number, because just as we know epsilon, we also know what uh, K is, and we find indeed that it really doesn't vary with the turbulent fluid number for over, a, you know, close to two orders of mag uh, two de orders of magnitude. You know, we're able to go from uh, 10 to the minus one to uh, maybe three or four by 10 to the minus three, and it's a, it's a cloud of a PDF, but it really is not varying and is uh, very, very close to this uh, half uh, value. And interestingly, our data sits very much bang on top of the um, uh, Colorado State uh, uh, data and suggests that this is, the, is very much a possibility. If you force uh, stratified flow with low wave number internal gravity waves, you do indeed see a picture that is very much um, uh, very efficient mixing, even when it's strongly stratified. But it is critical to understand that that efficient mixing is associated with a layer, -wide, layer interface, layer interface type uh, uh, structure in the flow. So a final uh, little detail to say that. So we see layers, I say we have strongly uh, turbulent regions which are relatively weakly stratified, and then we have interfaces where the flow is um, uh, very strongly stratified and not so turbulent. Can we actually, rather than just wave my hands, can we automatically identify such regions? And so we, get, we went to this process, we looked at three different simulations which had an average value of the buoyancy Reynolds number when we take the volume average of epsilon and the volume average of, the, uh, of n squared, we have one that has a very large value of buoyancy, a relatively large value of the buoyancy Reynolds number and one that has a relatively small. And the turbulent fluid number, remember that's epsilon over nk, so it's local values, its average value over the whole flow is relatively large in this case, so the F1 is, is um, weakly stratified and F3 is strongly stratified. But then we developed a, an automatic algorithm that said, okay, let's look at places where the entropy is large and indeed in particular where the flow is statically unstable and we'll call them a turbulent patch if the turbulent intensity is sufficiently large in those regions. And then neighboring to those regions, there's another criteria that it's some, some of it is above and some of it is below. We'll call that intermittent, which we've plot with the green. 
And then anything else that's, that's quiet we'll call a quiescent layer. And then we'll conditionally average our calculations to say, okay, when the flow is very, very strongly stratified and its overall average value of the buoyancy Reynolds number is small, what's the properties actually in its turbulent regions? Because in the turbulent region, the epsilon is a lot higher than the average value because an awful lot of the flow is completely quiet and the n is maybe smaller, right? So can we look at this conditional averaging? And that's what's done here, right? So we look at these, so F1 was a flow that we looked at how much of, the of it was a patch and we found 96% of the flow was turbulent. In this weakly stratified case, 96% of the flow was turbulent, was in a patch. Whereas the F3, this picture I'm showing here, only 4% of the flow was in the turbulent patch. But then within the patch, the buoyancy Reynolds number was 177, very similar to the patch value of 240 of the, of the weekly stratified case. And so what this means is that if you think you have a strongly stratified flow, you mustn't think that means that it isn't very turbulent if its average value of those buoyancy Reynolds number is small. All it means, it seems, is that only a small volume of the flow is turbulent. But in the places where it's turbulent, it really is as turbulent as a flow that's completely turbulent everywhere. So strongly stratified turbulent flow is usually, should usually be thought of as spatio-temporally intermittent turbulent flow, where there is weak stratification where the flow is turbulent, and then a lot of strongly stratified regions where the flow is quiescent. And what I've just described here is saying, has some, definitely has physics, but was data-driven approach. I, you know, you could kind of, it was automatic. I mean, if I wanted to sell it, I could say it was machine learning, right? We developed an algorithm to identify regions which were turbulent and then sub-analyze those regions, which we call patches. And we found that the difference between being strongly stratified and weakly stratified was just that on average, was that you had a relatively small part of the flow that was strongly turbulent when you were strongly stratified. And so, some of these ideas will eventually appear in a, in a review article. The key point that I want to uh, say is really this point seven, that is, there is suggestive evidence that strongly stratified turbulence should be thought of as patches of a vigorous turbulence in local regions of relatively weak stratification which is embedded in relatively quiescent regions of, strong, of significantly stronger stratification. And also the point six. Actually, gamma point two, which for the aficionados is a thing, seems to be associated with if the flow is weakly stratified and you are able to sustain the turbulence for a long time, you have a turbulent Prandtl number which is about one, which suggests that that is the natural thing that you get for... Um, uh, for uh, the onset of the um, Osborne to be consistent with the Osborne model. Okay, so I think I've been going for almost precisely an hour, so I think it's about time for me to stop. But here are the, the conclusions, which are not really, which really link back to the point about we don't really know anything. I said we wanted to understand did this mixing parameter, this flux coefficient gamma, depend on parameters. Sometimes it appears to depend on the buoyancy Reynolds number, particularly for the Kelvin Helmholtz overturning, but sometimes it doesn't if we really control for uh, make the flow definitely be steady state. Does it depend on a Froude number or a Richardson number, something to do with the stratification? Well, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't because particularly when it's very, in some sense, strongly stratified, that last case, we do seem to find that it doesn't depend on the turbulent Froude number any longer. But you definitely do sometimes see when the turbulent Froude number and the Richardson number are co correlated. Indeed, I didn't even go into it, but sometimes the, the Richardson number and the buoyancy Reynolds number are correlated. The Richardson number is n squared over s squared. The buoyancy Reynolds number is epsilon over nu n squared. So there's sometimes an inverse correlation between the Richardson number and the buoyancy Reynolds number, which makes life complicated for understanding, um, uh, for uh, separating different physical effects. We often find gamma to be close to 0.2, particularly if the flow is steady, but history can really matter. And so if we have big overturning Kelvin Helmholtz billows, it can sometimes be bigger. 
Does it vary monotonically or non-monotonically? That's important. Uh, the non-monotonic variation with parameters is important to explain why you get this layer interface structure. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And the interaction between deterministic physics-based models and a more data-driven approach is really, I think, the way uh, forwards, which I just hinted at with the last uh, slide. So once again, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will once again give an acknowledgement to all my co-workers. Thank you very much. That was a, that was a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess Rama has uh, an, another question. Uh, go ahead, Rama. Yeah, so uh, forgive my ignorance, but can you give a reason for what is this magic number 0 0.2? Like why it is even thought of as 0 0.2, that's point 0.1. And the next thing is you saw 0 0.2 in your Kuwait flow uh, all the time, um, although presumably the thing is so well mixed in the middle, so most of the stratification must be close to the walls. No, the, the, so where does the point two come from? That is still, I, I would say that is still quite mysterious mm. because, and, and I think it's a very uh, instructive uh, situation from the, uh, the Kuwait experiment because it seems that you actually have, um, when the stratification is weak and so you are able to have turbulence maintained, the turbulent prandtl, the associated with that idea is the turbulent prandtl number is about one. So the eddy diffusivity for the, um, the way you're dissipating the momentum is the same way that your, your scalar gets pulled along. So that's very arm wavy, but it's a, you know, an average quantity. And so, so that says they're in lockstep. But that then means that you expect the flux Richardson number and the Richardson number to also be in lockstep because it's just, that's the math. But the detail is then why does the gamma point two is, it seems if you require the turbulence to be in steady state as at as high a stratification as it can be to still be in steady state, that seems to be associated with the Richardson number about 0.15 to 0.2 for some reason. When you go to a higher Richardson number than that, when you have an appropriate Richardson number to be defined across your entire flow, so um, in, the, uh, in, in, in this problem, I definitely had that case because we, would, we would had a linear velocity profile, linear density profile, so I could definitely say that the Richardson number was uniquely defined. Then it seemed that the highest value the Richardson number could be such that I was turbulent was about 0.16, which gave me gamma 0.2. That appears to be a still not explained process. But the question, this then comes back to the question you ask about the um, stratified plane coet. Your intuition was exactly, I, I, it was exactly the intuition I had, was that you would expect it to be well mixed in the interior and uh, more strongly stratified at the walls. But actually, if you are, because of the form of stratified plane coet flow, you fortuitously have the case that you have a you are automatically requiring a constant vertical flux of, of heat of buoyancy. Because of the of the require, if you're at steady state, you are require you know you have one plate at one temperature, one plate at another temperature. There's there's got there can't be a build up of heat within the system. It's got to just be going through the system or down to the system perhaps. That then means that you can apply Mononobokov theory. <laughs> and so then what actually happens is through the interior of the flow, except in boundary layers, you get very close to a linear profile in density and a linear profile in velocity. So the Richardson number that I plotted here, I think is actually the Richardson number at the mid plane, but everywhere except in the boundary layers, it's really quite close to that value. So it's really, so you actually have a linear profile and velocity mean profile and linear profile in density in this problem too. So actually, that is once again, you have terminal parental number one and the flux Richardson number is about the same as the Richardson number. And so then the question is what's happening when you get up here, which is, you know, the Richardson number is trying to get bigger than 
uh, that's t that's 10 to the minus 1, that's 0.2. For some reason, I, we're not able to have data beyond the 0.2. It's only going to about 0.15. And that is, we're not able to keep the flow turbulent beyond that because no matter how, fa how um, fast you push the walls, effectively in this problem, as you move the stratified plane correct flow, the faster you move the walls, the higher your Reynolds number, and the bigger the density jump you do across the system, the higher your uh, Richardson number can be. And as you make the, the Richardson number bigger, even as your Reynolds number gets larger and larger, you'll always end up with a region near the boundary, a viscous boundary layer, where you, can't, you locally get too strong a stratification. And that local too strong a stratification switches off the turbulence. So it seems that for some reason we still don't understand, in plain correct, stratified plane correct flow, you can't maintain turbulence beyond a Richardson number of about 0.16. The, the mixing increases monotonically to that point, but then you can't be turbulent anymore. When we did the steady state calculation, the, the um, linear profiles, if it was to be in steady state, it had Richardson number about 0.16. And the Holmbo simulations, the, the PDF said that the Richardson number got to be about 0.25. We did a calculation, there's something I didn't talk about here. We did a calculation of what we call temporal gravity currents, which is we had a, a, a layer of, of dense fluid and our computational box was set up to be at an angle. So it was like it was going down the slope. There, the entrainment seemed to switch off when the Richardson number got about 0.2, but the mixing efficiency up to then was about point, was, was lin scaling linearly with the Richardson number. So this is a very long answer to your thing to say, it seems that turbulence cannot be uh, sustained if the Richardson number, an appropriate global measure of the Richardson number is much bigger than 0.2, and for turbulence below that value, the turbulent Prandtl number is about one. So therefore, the original thing that Osborne said was right. The, the gamma is bounded above by a point two. And if you require the turbulence to be in steady state, it seems that it is at point two. But it's still not, I, I still, it is not resolved. The, the question, the real question, the chicken, the, the, the but why question next is, why cannot turbulence be sustained beyond 0.2, Richardson number appropriate measure? And it's not clear. I don't know the answer to that. Because that is a different question, from, that is a different point from the Miles Howard theorem. Uh, because one is a statement about uh, how a flow can be unstable, and the other one is about how a flow can maintain enhanced dissipation, large range of scales, what we'd call turbulence. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Uh, I, I had a question. So you, you talked about the, the turbulent patches in the strongly stratified case. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm assuming they are highly anisotropic. They, they're largely 2D. Yeah. Right? So uh, is, is the instability or is, is the turbulence uh, that, that these generate, is it caused because these, these 2D structures are rubbing against each other? Or, I mean, you started this talk by talking about internal gravity waves, but I kind of wanted to push this idea that maybe these are you know, still shear driven by- Oh, oh yes. Yes. So the, the internal gravity waves, the breaking of internal gravity waves is the most likely mechanism by which uh, turbulence can be injected in the interior of the abyss of the ocean. But, but what is actually the mechanism by which that uh, breakdown occurs is, um, is not at all uh, clear. Now, um, in this picture, the way we were inject, we were, once again, this was a low wave number forcing, was injecting energy kind of magically. And when we required to have a very strong background density gradient, the flow organized itself absolutely. The, the patches were, you know, highly anisotropic in structure, but within the patch, the turbulence was quite 
isotro- you know, it was a high value of the buoyancy Reynolds number. There's also an issue that high value of the buoyancy Reynolds number and, and um, uh, implies that there's quite a distance between the, the Osmodov scale, the largest uh, vertical scale, which isn't strongly affected by stratification, and the um, Kolmogorov scale, the viscous dissipation scale. And if those are sufficiently widely separated, then you have the possibility of an inertial range in between, so you can, which, is, which has the possibility to be both very much smaller than the Osmodov scale and very much uh, bigger than the Kolmogorov scale. So you could imagine that you have... Um, uh, a chance of isotropic turbulence, but in a very, um, in a much more recent, in an even more recent uh, uh, calculation, we have actually looked. Uh, Chris uh, Harland, my PhD student, has looked at the case of um, uh, having a, a internal wave interact with a shear profile. So effectively hitting a critical layer, which is one way, one of the ways that you could imagine that the um, uh, energy would be naturally dumped and we've been looking at trying to understand where the how the wave breaks and trying to interpret whether it is breaks through a shear instability or whether it's effectively a convectively driven process right. and trying to understand that because uh, there's a whole other bit of that i haven't talked about which is that convective large overturning type uh, uh, mixing you expect to be more efficient which i think is part of the reason that calvin Helmholtz uh, is observed to be more efficient so i think that's a long long answer to say you were saying about the patches and the shear driven yes that is my picture i think of what is by far the most common uh, mechanism is still a shear instability but the issue is it's not necessarily a vertical uh, shear like a Kelvin Helmholtz because you could if you there is a real attraction to having horizontal shear because horizontal shear introduces vertical vorticity and then you have a whole other cascade mechanisms these zigzag instabilities of uh, Billant and Shomaz and other uh, related concepts can if you have vertical vorticity that will inevitably introduce uh, in a stratified flow that that will introduce instabilities that introduces uh, uh, breakdown and those breakdowns will drive mixing. You, you haven't been able to tease that connection out. Though. Oh, no, 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 no. These are, um, you know, the, these are quite uh, demanding uh, calculations. I mean, the, um, the one uh, did this constant N uh, case, you know, we were really arguing that the buoyancy um, uh, Reynolds number you know, you really needed to get your buoyancy Reynolds number over 300. Once again, I'm saying yeah, it's the four thirds power, but it's the, you know, it's the scale separation. And we said the buoyancy Reynolds number needed to be above 300. And uh, for our larger calculations, we had uh, uh, whatever this is, uh, 100 billion grid points, right? And um, it, it, these are very, very demanding uh, calculations. We're indeed doing, a, um, hoping to go another, another layer again. To, to do the real problem is really challenging, right? Because you, because, and this is, I haven't once again talked about the, I only briefly mentioned one case of changing the Prandtl number, right? You really want to be doing a Prandtl number about seven, four to 10, in far, really, really big domains, right? Both because the, the picture of these uh, U over N um, vertical scale, but you have a very long horizontal uh, uh, scale and then the u over n is kind of the outer scale and then you have to have an osmodov scale which is smaller than that and then and then that osmodov scale still needs to be an awful lot bigger than the viscous scale you know you need tens of thousands of grid points in each direction to start to see the real numerically to start to see the real process that you're talking about and i think is right which is this this idea that you have these big pancakes these highly anisotropic pancakes sort of going around i, I suppose <laughs> part of the thing of lockdown is you get to see films again right you know like they're like big star wars uh, uh star destroyers right and they're these big big things and big big pancakes and when they go past each other then locally you have a sheer instability that drives a local pat re-injects a local patch of turbulence and the thing is you need to have these enormously large in in the horizontal compared to the verticals. So they've got to have this pancake geometry that when they rub against each other, still the local shear layer they develop has to be at local high Reynolds number. And that is enormously computationally demanding to actually get the right picture. 
you know, um, Peter Dionysus and uh, Chi Zhu uh, uh, have just did a paper, you know, a decaying wake uh, paper that was in PRF in 2019. And they were just starting to be able to see this uh, dynamics once again at Prantl 1. And, you know, we need to be at higher Prantl numbers. It's, 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 decades away unless we get some fancy um, quantum computing or something to be able to do these calculations and then it's a nightmare to analyze them which is why I'm sort of thinking any way that you can automate the process to do some kind of machine learning to uh, automate the process that you analyze them to identify things because the natural and I you know I presented here this turbulent Prandtl number and I'm arguing in terms of and that's like an average quantity but really another one of my um, um, conclusions is really that you should be I, I jumped over it that you really should be considering considering structures rather than statistics because the structures tell you what's happening and, it, and it's really this layer interface uh, idea and these two layers rubbing against each other pancakes are really going to tell you the truth of, uh, of what's happening and that's really a structures picture rather than a statistics picture and so to be able to identify structures quantitatively in very large data sets I think you need to be able to automate the process at least to make it robust right so not just say I've seen a pancake but have a, an, a, a justifiable algorithm to say this is a pancake because I defined a pancake in this way and I've gone looking for it and I found it right right yep uh, Ritarath, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. So, uh, so my question is just to relate uh, to the first uh, 15 minutes of your talk, uh, uh, where your motivation was the oceanic uh, uh, to calculate and how important the heat in the ocean was, and then uh, you moved on to the actual mixing efficiency in a stratified flow. So, um, uh, according to my knowledge, uh, so people mostly have been using a constant uh, mixing efficiency in the ocean. And yeah. as you all as and as you have shown and as you have answered in your uh, the penultimate slide that it depends sometimes on many parameters and could be many parameters could be discovered in the near future. So uh, what uh, so what what's your bird's eye view or uh, a critical view of using such a thing for um, for the ocean? Because you again said that internal gravity waves is the majority and but no one knows how it breaks. So uh, that way you can't be sure what to use and for the next decade or so uh, uh, how it could be improved or how not using a constant gamma could be improved well so i think um two things <laughs> the the first is constant gamma is often used to um uh, analyze observational data but the actual climatological models are usually using more sophisticated things that you know like the KPP method it, it, it has a, a you know dependence on a low an estimate of the stratification and more recently there's been particularly going towards a depth variation in the parameter and I think that is the uh, best obvious thing to do first deeply influenced by the you know the observations of Kurt Pauls and you know that dissipation is intensified near bottom roughness I mean it's not it's 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 brilliant but it's it's not surprising when you start thinking about it right so having a, a, a sp spatial variability is the next is a thing and then the other issue which I have um, didn't talk about but it kind of glossed over but is embedded in this kind of picture one of the critical parameters of uncertainty is not just what gamma is the taxation rate but but where you pay the bill right the non-local effect right so for example you have tidal tidal flow this picture here you know the, you go backwards and forwards over uh, some topography how much mixing happens locally to look uh, how much that energy that's taken from the tidal field from the moon whatever right and it ends up here how much of that is um induces mixing local to the topography and how much of it is, sends those waves off non-locally and they break somewhere else due to interaction with a shear hitting a critical layer wave wave interaction one of these other things and that that parameter is typically called q right the, the way it's partitioned and that partitioning is hugely affects the uh, developed um, um, 
the, the output um, density stratification that you get because it you know you could be that not it's, it's not only a question of it, is the turbulence very efficient near the boundary but does it or does the energy get dumped there or do the waves take it non locally and so I know that there's um, activity in the the next generation a lot of that is really trying to trying to connect um, data with you know observational data with this next order of saying can I have spatial very how do I introduce spatial variability in something like camera to reflect the fact that different region I expect to have mixing in different regions more intensely because of this that or the other you know we we have a particular planet so we know there's you know there's the mid-atlantic ridge or what there's Hawaii you know you know what is the effect of local hot spots in the mixing compared to um, uh, saying it's all the same everywhere that's the that's the big prize for the next generation of models they, they're doing it now definitely but it's improving that and putting and having a correct combination between the data assimilation and uh, um, the physics based arguments about well i have so many internal waves being formed at this topography and it is correct on physical grounds that so much of the energy is uh, uh, dissipated locally and so much goes somewhere else okay thank you the, there was a question when we were talking about the pancakes, there was a question in the group chat. Uh, should we expect anything different if instead of only having shear in the vertical, we have shear in the horizontal? And I think we touched upon that. Uh, yes, that yes. There is shear in the horizontal. Yes. So, if we, so that, that's, that's something that I'm very, very, very interested in. Shear in the horizontal um, will induce vertical vorticity. So you can inject a certain amount of energy, and you. But it seems that 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 vert, and the, but those vertical vort vortices are just prone to breaking up on this u over n scale. So they they are a mechanism by which you will get layer by which you get layering, and is a mechanism by which you're able to inject energy when you think you have a very strongly stratified situation to then break the. Um, uh, the strongly stratified situation into layer interface structure. So yes, that's definitely, um, and, and that's an quite un. There's been, you know, there was seminal work by Satami Saka um, uh, and uh, Basak, uh, whatever, 20 years, 15 years ago. But but that is really something that I think could do with being more investigated. Even though it's it, it's it's hard, right? Because you you need. Um, you're inherently three-dimensional and, and so on. But we, we, we've investigated, we, we, even the, um, with the uh, postdoc uh, called uh, Dan Lucas, we looked at the case um, of the uh, Kuwait flow, uh, but turned the direction of uh, gravity. We thought, um, so, so here's the, the typical picture of uh, Kuwait flow, and of course this is, we have gravity pointing in this direction. But you could imagine turning um, uh, the flow on the uh, on its side. Um, so you have a vertical you have a vertical stratification. You have a linearly stratified fluid to start with uh, in the vertical, and you have the two the plates are vertical. That their boundary condition is is now is now different in terms of their density value, but the but they and they are inducing a shear. That, so the shear is horizontal, but the Spanwise stratification, right, and that spontaneously layered, and also could not sustain um, um, instability. It couldn't sustain turbulence when the flow got very strongly stratified. You you can correctly define a, a Froude number for that, not really a Richardson number, because the uh, shear and the uh, buoyancy frequency aren't pointing in the same direction. But once again, it's sta it's it's stabilized at some value. Then so that flow, interestingly, is prone to an, an instability. The, um, group in Marseille for Chini et al. came up, found this uh, um, new instability uh, of, of that uh, flow. Um, but that, even if the flow, even though the flow is unstable, it can't be. When the flow is very strongly stratified, turbulence does not survive. Very interesting flow. Um, so you you have the same continual trade-off that you can get more energy. You think you can get more energy in 
when you introduce horizontal shear because you introduce vertical vorticity, that vertical vorticity generically is prone to zigzag type instabilities, which lead to a layer interface structure, which scales like U over N, where U is some characteristic velocity scale and N is the characteristic uh, uh, buoyancy frequency you thought you started with. So if I extend your analogy, uh, you can't escape the tax man. You can't escape the taxman. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's it, it, like uh, it has the ring of truth. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, there's one more question. Sid, go ahead. Hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. This is something I'm not sure if I missed this uh, or so, but towards the end when you showed the Taylor Quare experiment and you had very sharp uh, density interfaces, what I was, yeah. uh, what I was wondering was... Um, so the local density variance seems to have some kind of periodic uh, behavior, right? And yeah. whereas, uh, and what is the behavior of the of the global um, density variance? Is that sort of fixed for the kind of parameters you have? Whereas locally, this thing is doing some sort of periodicity, or uh... no? For for us, it was it had a slow rundown, right? So so this was actually stratified with salt, and so you have effectively. Um, um, insulating uh, top and bottom boundaries. So what's what actually is plotted on the right is the flux because you're able to actually measure by density, by the um, conductivity probe going up and down. And what actually is happening is that there's a, a, a steady transport of salt from the bottom towards the top. Uh, and because you have the zero boundary condition, the top, the stratification at the top, the dense, the salt content at the top the number of salt molecules at the top is continually increasing and the number of salt molecules at the bottom is continually decreasing. So in the limit of very, very long time, but these, this um, poor old guy, um, th these experiments would take like a week. Uh, you know, you needed to take track of the, you see the, the green line is the fl flux due to probe siphon, right? So the, the you know, conductivity probe siphon a small amount of uh, fluid to, to measure the conductivity and hence the, the salt content. But the, these experiments took weeks, uh, or could take weeks, and, the, and still you hadn't completely homogenized them. But they were run-down experiments. Well, effectively what happened was you had a very smooth, steady behavior of the flux not changing much, and then the flux leapt up when you finally overturned. So you remained in this layer-wise structure for days, and then eventually the, the global density difference gets small enough that then the mixing dynamics changes from this scouring dynamics to a big overturn and it gets homogenized. So uh, I don't know, entirely know whether I actually answer the question you asked. Right. No, no, I, I understand this better than at least. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I guess. I guess I don't see any more questions. If not, uh, feel free to uh, unmute your microphone and let's thank our speaker for giving this wonderful talk. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.